When you make more money than 90% of the population, you're not worried about inflation, you're not worried mm-hmm. about yeah. interest rates. Those problems are for people who are not making enough money. You That's were right. married before you were successful, let's say. When we got married, they thought that I graduated and had like a great job and all that <laughs> shit. There was a time that we couldn't pay that rent because I was chasing my dreams. This whole Russia-Ukraine stuff is actually maybe the complete opposite. This is a mass propaganda. What is the reality here? Why is Putin and Russia being demonized? Why is everybody automatically going to Ukraine and supporting them? Even if I open my inbox now, it's going to be like hundreds of messages. How can I stop over trading? Just stop. You're an entrepreneur or you're trading or you have a business. There's a lot of risk attached to that. That what if this business does not survive the next 10 years? If you're going to have any involvement in global politics, mm-hmm. you have to have a conspiracy theory side to you. What happens Gaddafi in Libya, what happened to Saddam Hussein in Iraq. There's so much on that topic, I don't know where to start from. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode. Today we are joined by our good friend Raja. He's basically a resident of the show again, back for another episode, and a good friend of ours, Jeevan, as well. Uh, Jeevan, you flew, flew in from Canada. Yeah, I flew uh, in all the happen. way from Canada, Toronto to Dubai. And uh, it's been a good experience so far in Dubai, but uh, I'm looking forward to getting into this podcast for sure. I appreciate the opportunity. No, no, thank you for coming on. So um, I want to take this a different route to most episodes because we are a group. I think we should use the opportunity to have a diverse conversation and mm-hmm. just boys chilling, as mm-hmm. you said. Um, but yeah, before we before we get into that, I just want to make sure everybody knows who you are and your backstory. I've been following you for a few years. Uh, and I know you're very sharp with your knowledge in, in fundamentals. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you could give a quick backstory on, on your journey as a, as a trader and what you do these days. So, so basically, oh, I started getting into the markets over the last six years. And my first two years, I was dealing with the generic pattern everybody goes through. That trial and error where you deposit a little bit, you crash it. You're always trying to flip and double your account every single day. Mm. And I just wasn't feeling fully confident in the market because I felt like I didn't really know what was happening and why it was, why it was going on, right? So I focused a lot of my attention to learn more about the economic side of the financial markets and what's really driving price to do what it's doing, right? Whether it's something like a geopolitical tension going on that can change risk flows or something like an economic data report. So over the last four years, I did some intensive study into that and started to find a lot of success bringing together technicals and fundamentals to paint a much more vivid, clear picture of the markets and what is going on. And I found a lot of success with that. Through that process, I started this uh, market research company called Capital Hungry, which is just providing market research, data, news, tools and information to clients around the world. And um, you can find that on the YouTube, Twitter, and that, pretty much that. Yo, let's uh, backtrack here a little bit, right? Now, I've never asked you this before, and like, yeah. you know, like, I, I have no idea. Like, I've known him for about six, seven years now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How did you find out about Forex? Like, why not stocks or, you know, options or... Well, initially, I was more introduced to the stock market, as you said, because through college and business, they have these courses just teaching you about macroeconomic yeah. stock market and stuff like that. Yeah. But I wasn't really too interested in the individual companies and researching stocks. I was more interested on a global perspective of what's going on. Mm-hmm. And I found a lot more involvement in currencies, commodities such as crude oil and gold. So I already had I already had an understanding of the financial markets as a whole that it existed. And I had that introduction to stocks, but then transitioned myself more to look at what's going on in a global perspective. Yeah. Fair enough. Do you feel like uh, um, with trading fundamentals, it limits you from being able to trade intra-session, intraday, and it leaves you only swing? Or have you found a way to kind of combine... No, I find uh, with, with fundamentals, it can go from smaller time frames to larger time frames because you can have something like you're talking about with swing opportunities, with a geopolitical tension that's going on. For example, when Russia was invading Ukraine and you had a surge in oil prices or gold explode, <coughs> right? And you could play that for an extended period of days or weeks. Mm-hmm. But every single day, countries are releasing economic data reports. People mm-hmm. go to Forex Factory to see the red folder. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right yeah, yeah. But let's the red, trade the red folder the red folder right <laughs> but the red folder is important data that's going to be impacting price through the sessions which is common mm. we know how people go crazy over nfp mm. days and things like that right so i think that the market is always having different factors that are driving price across time frames for people to take advantage of depending what your style of choice is 
will you be uh, fundamentals first and using technicals to find your entry or is it technicals first and then fundamentals to reconfirm? To me, I think it's just a combination of both meshing together, right? Okay. Like um, I like to view it like in the aspect of looking at a sport, like looking at the sport of basketball or looking at the sport of football. Mm -hmm. You have to have your blueprint and foundational knowledge, mm -hmm. but then you also have to have that actual technical execution as well to take advantage. A lot of people, when they're looking from the outside in of watching a sport, they're like, oh, this guy is just kicking a ball. or This guy is just throwing the basketball into the hoop. But they don't understand all the intricacies that go into it of them and their angle that they're looking for, mm -hmm. the speed that they're trying to take advantage of. So I find that just both bringing it together, it just works hand in hand. I've seen with um, fundamentals, a lot of the time people use it for the directional bias. Mm -hmm. So they'll be like, okay, now Euro's bullish for the, ne for the next, I don't know, three to six months depending on how big the news is. And now you're using your technicals just to find entries along your directional bias. Yeah, it's it's 100% exactly what you said. So mm -hmm. it, it, the fundamental for sure gives you way more clarity of directional bias. Mm -hmm. And then diving into the charts, going from your intraday analysis to the lower time frames, just using, I, re, I use very basic technical concepts. Like okay. people say support and resistance, supply and demand, mm -hmm. trends, market structure. It's all the same to me, right? But yeah, hundred percent. Bring it together. What about you, like Raja? Do you do you use fundamentals at all, or you're you're primarily uh, technical? You know, to be honest. Um, so for fundamentals, like I'm not trying to hype you up, but I look at his analysis all the time because he's always going on about, oh, like you know what, Powell's saying this, or Powell said this before, so maybe they're going to lean into this area now mm -hmm. because. Um, if you've noticed the last, let's say, like four or five months, mm -hmm. we've seen interest rates on, on the U.S., they've just started to increase them over and over and over again, right? And, the, and in the beginning, I didn't quite understand because every time they would increase the rates, you would expect gold to go down, but gold would go bullish, mm -hmm. right? Because what happens in the press conference, like half an hour after the rates are released, they talk about, oh, you know, we've raised the rates, but but... We're trying to beat inflation, which is still there. Mm -hmm. So whenever they talked about inflation, I was like, okay, like you know, maybe this means gold's gonna go up, you know. So now I just look at it in a way that okay, like what are they basically talking about? Because I think that that's very important. Because in, in the beginning, I never really focused on fundamentals, but when I start to see these huge moves happen, because initially, whenever there's a news event, you trade the news, you get like 15, 20 pips, and, and then you're like, okay, I'm done. Right. Mm -hmm. But how am I able to write the whole move? You know, that comes from really understanding what they're trying to say in the press conference and what do they mean with the words they'll kind of like say, like, you know what, um, the inflation is still there or we're trying to ease uh, our monetary policy, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more that goes into that. I've actually noticed that about your trading now that you actually you take profits are a lot later now. Yeah. Over the last four or five months. Yeah, because what happened was... Um, like if you remember, like if you guys uh, remember when Trump came in the office, mm -hmm. right? Uh, USD went bullish, mm -hmm. right? And gold kept on going bearish. So we're like, okay, like you know, maybe that's mm -hmm. a long-term fundamental effect. Then we had COVID. Mm -hmm. COVID happened with every uh, breaking news that oh, there's a rise in cases, gold would go up. Mm -hmm. Whenever there'd be a tweet or news about oh, now we have a new vaccine, mm -hmm. gold would go down. And that's that to clue this in. That okay, so whenever there's a macro fundamental event happening, gold's gonna have a huge move. Mm -hmm. You know, and the most money I made was on Russia and Ukraine thing. Mm -hmm. I had a buy on gold accidentally and Russia just <laughs> invaded Ukraine. And in in two <laughs> hours, bro, gold went up three hundred and twenty points. Yeah. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah. Three hundred and twenty points. And I was like, what the fuck is going yeah. on over here? <laughs> you know, so so I think really understanding how fundamentals are working you can get those big gains mm. and that helped me out a lot especially with gold though because it's a safe haven right so whenever yeah. there's panic gold you goes can take up advantage there's... of the change in risk flows mm. and to add on to what roger's saying a lot of people um also the, he's talking about how much is involved to the fundamental side a lot of people don't realize that with the financial markets overall like all these institutions and the real market makers mm -hmm. they're always trying to have an edge and they're always trying to be ahead of the curve so the pricing in concept is a big deal as well, right? Mm -hmm. That's where you get that Wall Street rumor, uh, Wall Street saying, buy the rumor, sell the news. Mm -hmm. right? I was so the markets this, are always yeah. trying to move ahead of the curve. And for example, we saw that uh, with Russia and Ukraine, he said, when it first initially happened, you saw this surge in gold price, you saw this surge in oil price. 
But now, even though that invasion is still actively going on, it's no longer holding market impact because it's mm -hmm. been priced in. Mm -hmm. The markets took advantage of it. They made their money. They're moving on to look for the next thing now. Right. So that's also something we always have to keep an the eye thing on. You said well. of, of buy the rumor, sell the news. That kind of kept me fearful of jumping too much into fundamentals because I thought we are never going to get that information before the, the big players. Mm -hmm. So we're always the last people to find out the news anyway. And mm -hmm. then when I focused on my technicals, 99% of the times I won't even check Forex Factory and yeah. I'll enter a trade. And then 30 minutes later, it was really volatile. I'm like, oh, what happened? Yeah. I checked Forex Factory. I was like, oh, there was a news release. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> the, the, the technical there. showed me first and then yeah. the news happened to be the catalyst. Yeah. And that's just reconfirmed to me at least that... Um, the it's already priced in or yeah. the market is going to do whatever it's going to do and the news is kind of that that catalyst that yeah. makes the same thing going to happen it's faster like, it's like the rocket fuel you can call yeah. it oh so you're not right? even looking at like you know what no, news to the, is there to just, the point where yeah. i won't even check and then i'll be pleasantly surprised or or very quickly taken out of my trade yeah. and then i look and uh, okay this is a news release mm. um but a lot of the times the reason i say this is because when i'm back testing um, I'm not able to recognize when there's news. Yeah. Like when, a new, when you look back six months ago and you're looking at price action, you don't really know where the news is. Yeah, this price is just price. Mm -hmm. And then certain periods are more volatile than others, most likely because of the news. Mm -hmm. um, but the technicals, for me at least, reveal that move anyway. And then when I think buy the rumor, sell the news, things are already priced in. They yeah. find out before us. The news release is kind of like where the retail traders get smoked. But yeah. the big players have already entered the day before or hours before. Or, taking, or they take advantage after you see these liquidity sweeps. Like you could see mm. even with something like that's very volatile where they're expecting a lot of liquidity to come into the markets. Like uh, everybody understands non-farm payroll, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you have like non-farm payroll come out very easy to understand and it's very good numbers, mm -hmm. you'll still see and you expect gold to drop because mm -hmm. like safe haven, less demand in it. You'll still see gold go up 100 pips first. Yeah. take out all those orders then drop right so you just have to understand that um outside of just the basic direct data one-to-one -one, the market is always going to have its price set up so price is always the most important as you're saying mm -hmm. right yeah see i'm the big i'm a really big believer of the fact that the market is always cosmetically structured Everything, right everything's very surgical very surgical yeah exactly yeah. because because just the same thing you said that if price is gonna go down let's say 100 points it just can't continue moving down and then just drop 100 points mm -hmm. unless you have a flash crash mm -hmm. right so which is why i think like you know cosmetically the market has to be balanced so that's why you see that big move up and mm -hmm. then an equally like you know i don't know the word but like an equal and opposite move down yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. you might see the 100 pips up but then only 150 pips back down so it's yeah. more of a balanced move than just seeing a big crash or drastic change in price mm -hmm. that makes sense well the way it makes sense to me is that you can't just randomly go down because you need the opposing buyer to seller it's so true. it's kind of like it's collecting that liquidity it's collecting those orders and then those people are going to fuel the move the other way um i want to i want to jump into um for example, the other day while we were talking about it's like this whole Russia Ukraine stuff. It's like it's like a movie. It's it's like um it's like the what was it the book Art uh, of War. Art of War. Like mm. the things that uh, Putin is doing right now. And I think all of us here we're not too surface level to be like oh you know whatever we see on the news, whatever we see on on uh, surface level things, whatever the media is trying to tell us is not always the truth. Yeah. Especially myself when when it first came out and everyone was like putting the solidarity colors of Ukraine and and showing support for Ukraine. I was like, this is a mass propaganda. Yeah. What is the reality here? Why is Putin and Russia being demonized? Why is everybody automatically going to Ukraine and supporting them? Mm -hmm. In the beginning, it looks like, okay, they've invaded and, and that's pretty messed up. But when I started to look into it and, and Wally would tell me more, I'm like, okay, it's actually maybe the complete opposite. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to throw an open question and I, I want to discuss this topic. And if you have any thoughts to chime in. So um, with Russia and Ukraine, what we're seeing with this unification process they're pretty much trying to do, it's nothing new. Right. Mm -hmm. This has been going on for a long time, even even in uh, near term history in 2014, 2015, they attempted the same type of invasion as well. Right. Yeah. But that's their own uh, country's unification plans and trying to develop their economy further and so forth. But on the Western side of media, they're going to create propaganda to feed the U.S. military complex. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Every every week, every week, ever since Russia started invading Ukraine, You've been seeing the U.S. send billions of dollars in military aid, financing and packaging. Mm -hmm. And to the Western side of the media, they say it's aid. They say, oh, we're helping Ukraine. 
but this is this is all debt at the end of the day that's being owed from Ukraine back to uh, the U.S. And if they're not going to be able to pay it back with money, more than likely, the U.S. ends up taking advantage of Ukrainian resources, Ukrainian land, and setting up more NATO bases there and setting up more military complex there. So it all just ends up being a big factor to fuel the U.S. military complex, where then the U.S. uses their media power to make Russia mm -hmm. just look purely like the bad guy make Ukraine look like the victim and make them look like the savior that's trying mm -hmm. to come and help and save you, Ukraine. You think it's, it's that angle that uh, the U.S. wants to kind of like put debt, debt that they can't afford and therefore take control like they do in Africa? Is that the objective or is it more that um, kind of a NATO advancing their front to the doorstep of Russia and, and it's more of a play like that? It's all one. I think it's, it's like, I, I think it's like what, what's that saying? Uh, hitting two birds with one stone? Mm -hmm. okay. I think it's that type of, uh, both are being taken advantage of there for sure. No, it's the same thing if like Russia was to open up a military base in Mexico, Mexico's getting invaded tomorrow. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, 100%. So you, you can't demonize Russia for doing the same thing that the same reactions that anyone else would have. Yeah. And this whole thing of like, how's you can the, on paper, 200 billion from the US has been given in aid. How is Ukraine going to pay that back? Exactly. <laughs> right? And then all the statistics are off. Like, um, they say like 2 million people have left Ukraine and maybe 150,000 have died. Mm -hmm. But the actual population of Ukraine has halved since the war has started. Yeah. Crazy. Maybe 3 million people have died. Mm -hmm. At least 15 million people have left the country. And then now you got half the population. All your working class people are all wiped out. So you're just left with elderly. And kids that can't work, they've got 200 billion plus worth of debt to pay with the interest on top. They're just going to take control of the fertilizers, the grain silos, all the resources, all the resources right? that they have, and you and know, control and of the Black Sea. And it's very and one. it's very common we've seen with the U.S. to do this historically. They did the same thing in Iraq, right? They mm -hmm. did the same thing in the Middle East, where they bring and say we're bringing a democracy, we're trying mm -hmm. to help your people. And they end up just completely destabilizing the country and taking over all the resources, right? You know, the people are clocking on, though. The people are noticing yep. because every time I see now, like, a uh, video of, like, some oil deposit has been found or any yeah. black liquid on the floor, you the comments are democracy coming soon. <laughs> yeah, democracy coming soon. <laughs> the U.S. The flag is coming in. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the interesting thing is, I think uh, when we look at China, they're a lot smarter with their tactics where mm. the U.S. is always, like, military, war, invasion, takeover. But like you were talking about with Africa, China is doing something very similar in Africa, but more just from an economic front. Mm -hmm. They'll go to these very poor, underdeveloped <laughs> nations and say, hey, we're, we can come build infrastructure for you. We'll come build roadways, trains, uh, all this various infrastructure. Don't worry, pay us back in the future when you're more prosperous. But a lot of these countries, like you said, will never be able to pay back mm -hmm. these billions of dollars in debt. So China goes, okay, you can't pay back this debt financially from a, like a money perspective, okay, this port, it's now under China mm -hmm. ownership. This this coal mine or this mm -hmm. diamond mine or whatever it is, lithium spot, it's all under China ownership now. So they just end up, it's it's like that, uh, it's like that global game, that risk game, mm -hmm. you know, where they're slowly yeah. taking over the countries yeah. and taking over and you see the red color take over. It's just like that, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's actually interesting because what they'll do is they'll put enough interest that these countries can only afford paying back the interest. They never pay back the principal. And mm -hmm. then it's a takeover. It's a but takeover. also China's smart. They'll send their people. They won't send. They won't use local labor and, and try to boost the local economy. They are not on the condition that we send our own people, our own tech. Yeah. And, and the that, money that, comes back to China. Yeah, that, that country never gets out of um, out of that spiral. The thing is as well, like I, I think with China, the way they do it is a lot better than compared to the way like the West did it. Because mm -hmm. even now, there's um, we've been in some talks with um, certain commodity deals and we found like certain countries, the French have a first right of refusal mm. for their natural resources. So now these countries are not allowed to export their gold, export their oil, export the lithium, cobalt, mm. diamonds, whatever they have. If the French say no, they have to hold on to it until the French can say yes. Yeah. So they're not even allowed to sell their own resources to make money mm. themselves. That's how we see with yes. a lot of these sanctions work. Even <clears throat> um, Raja and I, on a smaller scale, when he was uh, living in Canada, of course, right? Uh, we noticed this with the Chinese foreign investment completely skyrocketing home prices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Incredible amounts. Like, especially when COVID came and even, well, when COVID came, it was different because I think all this outside investment saw the opportunity that, okay, like, you know what, there's COVID now and there's not m much money flowing around. We thought that, well, even you, 
that hey, I'm gonna hold back on buying a house because I think the how the prices are gonna go down. Thought it was too volatile. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah. they kept on going up, uh. and we're like, what the hell's going on over here, right? Like, um, we bought our house for about eight hundred forty thousand, and by the peak, that was at like one point six, one point six five, and I was like, what? 1.6, 1.65, and I knew guys who bought houses at 1.5, 1.6, and then they retraced all the way back down to a million, 900,000. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, it was nuts. We didn't, we didn't start to get a, even a slightest bit of correction in the real estate prices until they started uh, front-loading the rate hikes, mm. right? And even that wasn't really that much of a change because the foreign investment is so strong in Canada. Most, most Canadian citizens themselves, uh, the, the average working Canadian cannot can never own a home in canada at the prices right now never never especially with the interest rates much higher now house prices are still high in the millions of dollars like roger's saying Mm. and um and it's funny i was reading an article uh there's a there's a city just outside of toronto right called markham where a house even with these high interest rates went 500k over asking price because a chinese foreign investor liked the address it was a chinese lucky number so that just shows you that four just shows six you, or four eight. Yeah, <laughs> so that just shows you the amount of the amount of resources and wealth they have that they can completely take over. And and there, while the average Canadian citizen is struggling, can't afford a house, this guy's coming in paying half a million more for a lucky number, mm. oh right? So it's crazy like that. Yeah, it's like buying a number plate here in Dubai. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. was really crazy. When he was telling <laughs> you know me about, about that, yeah, yeah insane. that was insane. It's insane. Well, it's like I think part of the reason for that, at least, is because there's so many rental cars here. And the guy that has the car and wants to, you know, not look like it's a rental, mm. they got to show something that, okay, this is not a rental. Let me put a four digit or a three digit, or if you're crazy, two digit. Two uh, but yeah, these plates are um, sometimes more than the car. We were at the um, Hookabaz the other week and we we're like looking at the lineup, it's like one digit, two digit, two digit, two digit. It was like $3 million just of and, car and, plates. And the plates cost more than the car itself for some of <coughs> yeah, yeah, these two plates. Plate There's yeah. one that got auctioned last year in Eid for like 35 million dirhams. Yeah. I, I, I heard a story where one of them just bought it for his son. Okay, he was like a, who was like five, six years old, just for when he's ready to drive, he'll have a <laughs> two single or double digit number plate. Yeah. Also, the thing is, I bought a plate yesterday from a G class, and I was asking the guy, like, you know, these prices and all this, and he told me, brother, listen, if you're buying a number plate, it's not even about having a plate; it's about the plate has money on it. Mm-hmm. Because the plate is never going to appreciate. It's almost like an investment mm-hmm. the way they made yeah. it here. Yeah, exactly. Because like, he's like, listen, you got A to Z and A has a limited numbers. B has limited numbers all the way to Z, mm-hmm. right? If you got a, like a three-digit plate or a four-digit plate, your money is on that plate. Mm-hmm. You're never losing money on that plate. So yeah. he's like, that's why you're going to see like, you know, some Teslas with a plate that costs like, you know, 200000 or like, you know... 250k only because there's money on that plate if people have like you know black money or whatever they want to do with it all they're going to do is buy the plate slap mm-hmm. it on the car and whenever they need money they're like okay here's the plate for sale yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. that's it yeah. you know it works very well as a as an asset class now because for yes. example let, let's say watches the watches rolex every year is going to make a million more a million more a million more so unless there's new buyers in the market every year that, that price is going to settle at some point and it does there's fluctuations in the market but with this is there's only a limited amount of supply of the plates they're not going to create a new system so there's fixed power plates but everyone's coming to dubai yeah. and every g yes. wants every g now wants uh, an expensive plate so it's only going to go up it's yeah they, go up with the economy there's one i saw it, it was g6363 that was for about fifty thousand dollars right mm-hmm. and the guy said brother there's only one plate that's g6363 yeah. Yeah. Right. There's not any more they're gonna he come out. Control G that for price. the G wagon you're talking yeah. about, looking for, right? Yeah. That's good. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. But let me ask you this, right? Mm-hmm. Now, once you start to get profitable, mm-hmm. right? What was that one thing that was really hard to get over? I think for me, and it's a very common thing, is just over trading. Mm-hmm. Oh. It's just over trading, right? Even even if you have all this fundamental knowledge, even if you have your technical so sharp. When that, when that demon comes on top of your shoulder after you even take a winning trade to say, go get more, or you just took a losing trade and it says, no, you can get it back next trade. 
that's what really hurts people, right? So to stop. Actually, yeah. it's, <laughs> it's an addiction. It's an addiction, right? <laughs> yeah. If you're addicted to a drug, just stop. <laughs> just stop. If you're homeless, you're homeless, just buy a house. Buy a house. <laughs> yeah, like guys ask me all the time, bro, Raja, like I can't or even if I open my inbox now, it's gonna be like hundreds of messages. How can I stop over trading? Just stop. <laughs> Seriously, but, but just probably people never thought of that. You're just, right. just to, just to <laughs> further like add that on to that, because he's looking at a very direct A to B. To mm. further add on to that, everybody has the option where if they take a losing trade or a winning trade, they can sign out of there. They can sign out of the platform temporarily, yeah. right? And it, when you act, and I found a good little tip was um, actually having to physically sign back on to your account. It, having that little bit of time in between where you have a process of like mm. signing back on, opening up your charts again, it creates this, it creates this interruption from you just slight resistance. Warm. Yeah. It creates mm -hmm. an interruption to the emotional impulse. Mm. Right. Will you so, do that thing of, um, some people have like three strikes in a day. If I've taken three losses, I'm done or a certain amount of loss in a week and I'm done. Or you'll do, if I've taken a couple of losses, I feel mentally off. I'll log out. Or what is your yeah. over trading protocol? When I was first getting into it, I was more focused on scalping and I would have that three strike rule. But um, as I transitioned into more day trading, there's less execution in day trading, more waiting, right? Mm -hmm. So I might look for an entry on GBP, JPY if it's trending or gold during Asian or early London. And I'm only looking for one real execution point or trade. And, and I know, understanding from a day trading perspective, the range I'm looking to take advantage of, it may take multiple sessions for it to play out. Mm -hmm. So now you're more just managing and watching that singular trade rather, mm -hmm. than, um, rather than scalping, where, you, where scalps, always scalps are available. Mm -hmm. No matter when someone goes to the chart, you can mm -hmm. convince yourself for a scalp trade, right? Yeah, you start inventing uh, yeah. confluences. Yeah, I'm confused now because you're more of a fundamental, so therefore you're taking lo taking long-term positions mm -hmm. based on whatever. Then how do you end up scalping? No, uh, I meant just when I first started trading in my ah, journey, okay, I was it. more scalping okay. focused, right? Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then I transitioned into day trading, which, which exactly, as you said, was more coming from that fundamental influence. And mm -hmm. what you were discussing where you get the directional bias from a fundamental catalyst. So if I, if I knew that this interest rate, like the Federal Reserve is just front loading interest rates and mm -hmm. it's going to keep US dollar more bullish, I knew that if I was going to be looking for a Euro USD short and I'm looking to play dollar strength, mm -hmm. that can, that's going to maintain for possibly multiple sessions days even sometimes weeks mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. that would that's what helped me transition more to the day trading side it, i've even noticed that with roger's trades like you guys were saying where he's had more of that confidence as well to be more selective and then really milk some of these winners to take mm -hmm. advantage of these larger ranges because with his experience you have more confidence that this move is going to take place and gold is going to revisit this high or revisit this low you know what i mean so mm -hmm. yeah see my thing is a little bit um, different in a way now because uh, now that I'm trading, I'm aiming for a set dollar amount a month, mm -hmm. right? So if I so like my whole thing is like my expenses are about let's say ten twelve thousand dollars. If I can get around twenty five to thirty thousand in the first week week and a half, then I'm gonna let my runners run from the second week and the mm -hmm. third week and the fourth week because. I want to be able to lock in that amount as soon as possible, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Because once you trade for a living, you need that money to pay your bills and whatnot, right? And and to uh, enjoy your life. But like now that's what I do. Once I see that in the first week and a half, I've locked in an amount that I need, then I'm going to start to let my winners run. So guys ask me, so how do you decide that you're going to let a trade run? I'm like, I don't always let trades run. Whenever, let's say the first half the month, I'm in profits, then I'm like, okay, the rest half, I can just gamble with my positions. Either it's break even mm -hmm. or I'm just going to let them run. Mm. But let's say, so that sounds like a, you're having a good month. The month started very well. And then the, let, the second two weeks, you can kind of take the foot off the gas. What about in the other scenario where you don't get off to the best start, but you still have this dollar amount target? Yeah. How do you stop yourself kind of chasing that number and then over trading and getting yourself into a negative spiral? You have 30 days. No, 21 days. You have 21 mm. days to reach your target. Mm. That's and, it. and I think that, and I think that's a that's a great reminder where a lot of people, if they're if they might be losing in the first little bit of the month, they're very short sighted and they're only thinking about tomorrow, mm -hmm. right? They're only thinking about okay, I have to recover this or make this back. I need to do this the next session or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But having that more long term approach of like, okay, I may have taken these two losses in this first week. 
but there's still three more weeks left. Let's continue at the same controlled pace. And that's, I think that's a big factor to your discipline as well as having that more longer term approach, right? Not being as short sighted. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because uh, there was pound interest rates last week, mm -hmm. Thursday, right? I had a buy stop and they increased the rates more than expected. Remember? Yeah. They, they increased did. the rates more than expected. I had a buy stop. My buy stop got slipped 70 pips. Oh, I wow. lost seven grand right there. On what pair? Uh, pound yen. GBP, JP. Wow. That's a huge slippage. Huge slippage wow. because, because what, I mean, slippage happens when the news is either greater than expected or worse than expected. Just, this increased volatility is just out of your control, just, right? Mm -hmm. just they have massive. to fulfill the order at the fairest price. So Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So that happened. Now I'm like, okay, well, I'm done, right? So I didn't even trade. Then yesterday I took my second trade and yesterday I made $1,300, right? So the point I'm trying to make is even though like I lost 7000 but then I made 1300 in the trade yesterday, I'm still happy with that. You know, because whenever you're making money or losing money, you got to treat each trade in a way to say, okay, like, you know what? I had my one chance. Mm -hmm. I took my chance. Mm -hmm. I lost money or I made money. That's mm -hmm. it. Now you move on to the next day. Because the longer you stay, the longer you are, the same thing you said, your psychology is going to come into play and it's going to mm -hmm. say, okay, like, you know what? Now I'm creating, um, like, you know, trades that don't exist. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you execute on trades that don't exist, you're going to have losses that would have never existed. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> the and losses those, are going to be there. And those, and those losses will exist. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They say, oh, the market's always after me yeah. and the market wants to attack me all the time and mm -hmm. this is BS and this guy's a scam and that guy's a scam. Yeah. You're scamming yourself, man. <laughs> That's it. That's Just making poor personal choices. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I even noticed something about that where people have a very rushed personality in trading where, um, like, for example... Things like uh, the things that can bring increased volatility, like red folder news everybody looks at, like non-farm payroll or retail sales or something. When that's coming up, people go full leverage on that or they risk their entire account on that, not understanding these reports are every month. Mm. Every month there's an NFP, every month there's a retail sales, your PMI data. But at that moment for that current report, it's like they're never going to be able to trade again. So they yeah. have to make money on this NFP. They yeah. have to double their account. They have to do something here, acting like it's this opportunity is never going to exist again when the market is endless opportunities week after week, month after month. Same, we've been involved for the markets uh, for years now and NFPs every month, always same yeah. schedule, same time. You know what I you mean? You know what so, you're saying there? I found myself doing that in like 2018. Where <laughs> right? I'll, I'll go on uh, Forex Factory. Okay, red folder. Buy stop, sell stop, 20 pips <laughs> stop loss on both sides. We've yeah. no take profit because it can fly 100 yeah, pips, right? Yeah. Then I find myself getting taken out on both sides. Quick <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> loss, quick loss. Ah. They'll do the, yeah. whip, do the whip, whip saw and then, boom, then you're sitting there shocked. Like right? My buy got stopped out. I'm myself going, how do you buy and sell and lose? Yeah, or, <laughs> yeah, or the spread's going to activate your sell stop, yeah. then go the opposite way. You're like, yeah. what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, mm. in your situation, because you're more fundamentally driven, let's say you're looking at gold being bullish for the next foreseeable, will you still sell along the way or you'll only buy with that directional bias? No, because I'm more on a day trading perspective and I'm um, not looking to hold trades really for weeks or months, uh -huh. there's plenty of times while gold can be trending bullish where you can have bearish moves that can last sessions or days, right? Mm -hmm. So let's just say, for example, when we were watching gold trending more bullish during COVID with mm -hmm. the massive stimulus that was going on in low rates, or you were watching it trending bullish during that period of months with Russia and Ukraine, as gold is trending bullish more on the macro and higher time frame, you can still have your day-to-day -day data reports that could be optimistic data leading to like a 100 pip bearish move, right. where from a fundamental perspective, if you understand that, you can still take advantage and grab your piece. Mm -hmm. I'm never trying to really counter tre trend uh, trade and like trying to call a top or bottom, mm -hmm. but you can take advantage of a piece of a pullback and then still continue and set up and wait for the continuation of trend. That pullback your trade will be purely technical. It, it, most of the time, actually, it'll be a combination of technical and fundamental. So like, the, okay. so like the example with like Russia and Ukraine, gold, gold, more demand because safe haven, change mm -hmm. in risk flows, military uh, issues mm -hmm. going on. Macro, it's more bullish for a period of months. But let's just say that same week on the Friday, you have your NFP coming out for the mm -hmm. U.S. And, and the U.S. payroll numbers have nothing to do with Russia and Ukraine, mm -hmm. right? U.S. payroll numbers still may be very amazing. And in a short-term perspective, that's still going to lead to some gold downside. 
and almost almost like sets up prices for it to continue the trend, right? Mm -hmm. So on that intraday perspective, you can still take advantage of that data move as you're setting up prices to continue with the trend. Fair yeah. enough. I want to pivot and I want to talk about two things. One which I want you to touch on, Wally, is kind of the petrodollar situation, uh, because I know you know a lot about Libya, <laughs> Iraq, and so forth, because that will bring us nicely onto gold uh, mm -hmm. and, and kind of the moves that are happening with, with bricks and, and so forth. No, I'm a, I'm a rabbit hole guy. And before we said that, you said you're a rabbit hole guy as well. I'm for sure. A bit, I'm for sure a bit, I think if you're going to have any involvement in uh, researching global politics, mm -hmm. you have to have a conspiracy theory side to you. The thing is, like, th go. this has that this side of me has nothing to do with trading. It's just like, okay, I, it's most like seeking the truth of what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. Like, because there, there's a few channels I follow. Like, the top one, I think, is redacted. Mm -hmm. um, it's literally the redacted news, the news that they left out. Yeah. And then they were, well, I've been watching them for two years. One of our good friends uh, put us onto it. And it's like everything that you've been told for such a long time, everything that you believed in is just all fake. And then you see the evidence for it. And you see people like, the thing is the the population, I think, like they're so subdued at this point now where like people in the Senate will come out and say straightforward, this is happening. This Right now, this week, they're debating um, how 85,000 children on the southern border of the U.S. have been sex trafficked. Mm. And people don't believe that there's a corporate ring that's controlling all of that. But that's being debated in the Senate. They're bringing evidence that government people are involved mm. in this. Even um, mm. going this. into that sex trafficking thing, you guys know all about the Jeffrey Epstein, mm. right? All yeah. about yeah. that. But they're too busy talking about the submarine this week. Right. Yeah. Instead of Behind, yeah. the, behind yeah. the scenes yeah, right that. now, there was recently a headline where J.P. Morgan, the bank as a whole, had to pay $250 million fine for involvement with Jeffrey Epstein in the island. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> that's all just hidden behind all this other stuff that's going on with this uh, submarine yeah. that went missing. Or, you, yeah. You'll notice every single time there's something that people are too focused on, there's something being hidden. Exactly. Like, the, this whole week, Biden, two impeachment things have been put against Biden this week as well. We don't know about and you, that. And you haven't heard about it in mainstream news at all. Hunter mm -hmm. Biden's been charged. Yeah. But everyone's focused on the submarine. Hunter Biden's a funny guy. <laughs> <laughs> Hunter Biden? <laughs> He's living the dream, right? He's living the dream. Every, everything <laughs> paid for, <laughs> everything covered, everything gets covered up to. Yep. He's living the dream. <laughs> well, the media has their favorites and they have, they have yeah. their agenda. But yeah, mm -hmm. to touch upon, touch on if you can, Wally, um, the, the situations we've talked about in the past of um, what happened to Gaddafi in Libya, what happened to Saddam Hussein in, in Iraq, because that, that moves nicely into how things are changing with Saudi now um, and joining into BRICS. Okay, uh, there's, there's so much on that topic, I don't know where to start from. But um, I, I watched a few documentaries on Gaddafi, I, I read a few articles and there were some leaks um, and you know the Pentagon leaks and everything that were happening. Mm -hmm. on um, how they plan to overthrow Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein. They, make it, they always make it into an internal conflict in the mm -hmm, country, mm -hmm. make it seem like he's a dictator, he's a completely evil person, when, um, to be honest, Gaddafi was doing a lot for his people. Right. Uh, and so he wanted to move away from the petro... Anybody who wants to move away yeah. from the petrodollar yeah. and the, the, move away from the US was oil crazy. dollar? Um, king Faisal, uh, the king of Saudi, he mm -hmm. did the embargo, he gets assassinated. Yeah, um, he, His own cousin or someone assassinated him. But like the Muslim world look up to King Faisal as one of the greatest kings of Saudi Arabia in recent memory. Then you got Gaddafi himself came into power. Libya was the third poorest country in the world. Number three at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, by the time they killed him, um, he believed housing was a human right. So every Libyan had a house for free from the government. Mm -hmm. uh, he made a promise that I will house every Libyan before I house my own parents. His dad passed away in a tent. Mm. Uh, like before he could house his own parents. Yeah. What do you call um, every Libyan got housed? There was no water in Libya. He built man the largest man-made water project in history was oh. made by him, mm -hmm. where billions of dollars he spent um, to get fresh water everywhere. He made uh, Libya food independent. It's a desert country, yeah. but he managed to make it such that they can produce their own their food. own food. Then, and he wanted to make it so they could, they did not need outside help and they yeah. did not need any outside interference. So it gets more interesting than this. Um, when every Libyan got married, they got fifty thousand dollars. Healthcare was free. Education was the highest in Africa. If someone was ill and um, they couldn't find the cure for that illness in the country, they like they never had the um, resources for it. They had an allowance of sixteen hundred dollars a month to go anywhere in the world to get their healthcare treatment mm. paid by the government. They had all of these benefits. Um, 
and there's only 60 he million was, people he was in the creating country. almost dubai national benefits but for everybody right. in the country <laughs> he was, he was right? subsidized cars. Yeah. he was subsidized cars 50 percent. so you can buy any car the government will pay 50 percent for you mm. if you wanted to become a farmer they'll give you the land they'll give you the seeds and they'll give you the fertilizer and they'll give you the tractors all you had to do was work yeah um what was the problem with libya then is one of the only countries in the world that didn't have a central bank it's always this it's always a central bank and it's always and zero moving, and it's always moving away from petrol dollar as well yeah, so th- this is where saddam comes in yeah. because two years before he died he accepted payments for um what you call a uh, crude oil in euros he moved yeah. who moved on to the euro uh, he wanted to create a euro standard um obviously Gaddafi wanted to create the, the african national african currency backed by the gold mm-hmm. yeah there you go and then like the first thing that they did after he got killed was okay now iraqi oil is back to dollars yeah step one so and that's where it goes because I, and I they think put in that puppet government and they say it's a democracy for the people's benefit mm-hmm. now and it's all completely uh manipulated in western media yeah and it's, it's all one massive ring because um up until the gold standard when they come off it like the demand for the dollar was going down and then they had to artificially inflate the demand for the dollar by making everyone buy it so now i don't know why does a uh, I don't know African country need to convert their local currency into dollars to buy oil from Saudi Arabia like yeah. artificial inflation of demand and then that's what allows them to keep the Fed printing money printing money and they're saying like and the they US still hold is, that uh, and they still hold that world reserve currency status yeah, yeah. right so most most but, global debt obligations are still denominated mm-hmm. in US dollars commodity yeah. sales everything right and, but that's dropping rapidly as well because um 16% of global reserves are not in, as in it was like 63% up until last year this year is 47% so there's 16% difference people are moving away actively from the dollar mm-hmm. and is people are waking up in it because they say what's the greatest export of the US it's inflation the yeah. inflation mm-hmm. yeah, yeah yeah they export the inflation to Or everyone debt, else right yeah, yeah that's yeah. true and but the thing is as much as um as much as people want to move away from the US dollar the US's greatest power is their military right mm-hmm. and and the US dollar isn't just a currency it's now an empire right so it's going to be very difficult to move away from that standard without having major global catastrophe in my opinion on a mm-hmm. military standpoint or economic standpoint see i think um it's inevit- in- inevitable at this point now because before it was one person standing up oh saddam let's do this gaddafi oh let's do this mm-hmm. this guy let's do this one person at a time but this time the whole world are kind of everyone outside the west is united yeah um against uh well united for stepping away from the dollar standard like you're getting mm-hmm. almost more of this uh global division in half where you're having what you're talking about more the brick side right mm-hmm. like uh your russia um india and china but at the end of the day the us still has their allies with nato right but this is where i guess thing because mm-hmm. france applied for brics officially yeah. yeah how crazy I is heard that, that too. yeah but like here's the thing like the us dollar is so i would say like like you know like it has their cl- claws dug deep in the global economy so deep mm-hmm. it's not going to be really easy to get rid no, of that yeah, i think it's, it's going to take 10 20 at years least 10 20 yeah, years that's, at that, least that's that timeline years. makes more sense every every empire eventually falls but like what raja is saying is like <laughs> there's so much in global infrastructure from an economic standpoint that's rooted back to the US dollar global debt and so forth where um it's going to be hard to transition out of that without having a reset first oh, but yeah. that that's what i think there's a lot of powers in the world right now that are pushing for that reset and they say what what do you say is the perfect mix of problems right mm. because the perfect storm the perfect storm because yeah. now okay china and russia together are very very powerful mm-hmm. and they said um reports of a two-fronted war a war against china and war against russia at mm-hmm. the same time but there's one ukraine has depleted all of their military resources yeah maybe not their men but they've lost a lot of tanks they've lost a lot of weapons they lost a lot of um i don't know wh- whatever um military equipment they use Hmm. is given um the other side's allies a chance to actually see US military weapons on the battlefield for the first time. Mm-hmm. They they're seeing um they're getting hold of actual US IP and they're reverse engineering them making them themselves for cheaper. And uh, yes. even and even like some of these countries like you're talking about like China they're going above and beyond with their innovations. Like mm-hmm. uh China recently came out with their hypersonic missiles which like yeah. the US doesn't even have yet, right? Even Iran yeah mm. icbms but, but the only thing with uh the only 
the only contention I see with the whole China Russia alliance is it may be a short term alliance to、mm. uh, take over and dethrone the U.S. and you have that reset and you have this change in global infrastructure. But at the end of the day. China and Russia are still in competition as well.、Yeah. All of these countries,、mm-hmm. as much as you see in media of their divisions, U.S. is still doing tons of business with China. China's biggest customer is the U.S.,、mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? At the end of the day,、yeah. like, so, like it's more than just the U.S. dollar. The size of the U.S. economy and how much they contribute to the business of other countries is still massive, right? So, and at the end of the day, when we're looking at this relationship between Russia and China. They can have this team up thing, but China's mentality—I don't know if you've heard of their 2050 plan or whatever. China still wants to be the world dominating powerhouse, right? They don't want to be oh China and Russia at the top. They want China, China at, at the, the top, top yeah, right? Yeah. So it's going to be a crazy, crazy times over the next ten, twenty years. Where、uh, have you seen the stuff with、um, the bonds that China China is holding and what leverage they have because of the way the interest rates are going? And China has like. Between the account that they have in the Netherlands and Hong Kong, and their own personal bond holdings,、mm-hmm. they have enough bonds to basically destroy the dollar today if they wanted to by、mm-hmm. dump. So they take a loss of a trillion dollars,、yeah. which they can、uh, at this point they can absorb that loss. But that is enough dumping in the market to actually destroy the. In, in, in a normal situation, no. But with the way the interest rates Ch- are, China for sure has the power to、uh, to do that type of damage. But like、mm-hmm. I said, it goes back to almost like. Almost like they're losing such a. It's like a. It's they're losing such a strong long term customer. It's like if you have、mm-hmm. a drug dealer, you might have this customer that's very annoying, but he keeps coming back and you don't want him、business. to overdose. <laughs> you don't want him to overdose. You don't want him to die. <laughs> you don't want Roger want to, to tell him to stop. <laughs> right. You don't want him to quit. Right. You want him to keep coming、yeah. back and providing you business. Right. So, th- it's that twisted relationship I almost、mm-hmm. see with China and the U S. Right. I feel that、like、even if the if all of this stuff happens, the U.S. has no choice but to still buy from that customer is not gone. Yeah, that customer will never be gone. Like、mm-hmm. it, they'll they'll still be there, buying whatever they need from whoever they need, but the terms of the business deals will be different now. The power will be in someone else's hands. The power will be the deal、China's、will always、hands. take place, but it'll be on someone else's terms. But、uh, that would be a long term recovery because if you were to dethrone the U.S. dollar and destabilize the U.S. economy, you'd be driving that country into a depression, right? Pretty、yes, much, right? and so, I've I, I I don't know from everything that I've seen, I'm a strong believer. Like a lot of people are coming together, and that's their intention. They want to drive the U.S.、Mm-hmm. into a depression. Yeah, like the the thing is like everyone's kind of fed up. Like, but, but, why but, is my currency pegged here, and why is this here, and why do I have to do business like this, and why? It's it's also that let's say a country like Pakistan who wants to borrow money、uh, from the IMF. They have to sell their soul. They have to, you know, unfavorable which, which we're seeing interest rates、uh, and whatever. No, But、right? if the U.S. wants that same amount of money or any any country, they have to submit a debt. Yeah, the U.S. can just print it. But then any other country that print more of their currency,、yeah. they get they get they penalized for it.、Yeah. You know, you you devalue your currency. Is,、yeah. But Pakistan is so bad because、uh, you'd probably know this.、Um, for the first ever time, the what do you call um not um LNG export um the natural they, they, gas they, yeah yeah they put they put a bid out for it. And no one bidded on it because they have no no faith in、um, Pakistan.、Economy、They're gonna run、right、out、now. of natural gas by November. Yeah, no one、um, feeds into it. Yeah. So talking about running out,、um, f- some people may not know this. You guys probably may not know this. He had a corporate job at one point, right?、Mm-hmm. And and I remember we used to like you know talk in the groups and stuff like that. And he's like, yeah, I'm at my job, this and that. And you transitioned from your corporate job to like leaving that job. And then you jump straight into trading,、mm-hmm. right? So jumping in trading full time, leaving the job. How was that a process? Like, did you think, okay, well now my consistent income is gonna stop, and now I'm in this world of oh, like how am I gonna make money? Yeah, it,、uh, there was that fear, but to sort of、uh, take away pressure from that fear, I I took your advice actually, if you remember, was to first like have enough money and save a nest egg. Where you、mm. can cover at least a year's worth of your expenses and bills, right? So for me, with with my family and my upbringing, everybody was just more like go to school, get a nice stable job, get married, and pay your bills, pay your mortgage, and live your life, right? So when I wanted to transition out of that corporate life, I was working at the Royal Bank of Canada. It's a very like for my family and the outside looking in, it was like a prestigious position. Like, oh, you're working in the Financial sector,、mm-hmm. you're working at this big bank. You got to put on your suit and tie, right? And and they're like, why would you ever want to leave that? 
Mm-hmm. Right? So a lot of... How much I, were you making if you don't mind me asking? I, was, uh, I started out at 60K okay. and I maxed out around 90K. That's oh, a pretty, pretty good job. Yeah, at that time, right? Within a four to five year period, right? Yeah. yeah. So on paper and to your friends and family, they're like, oh, Jeevan's working at a bank. He's making, he's putting on a suit and tie. He's done. That's yeah. the peak, right? He's set almost six figures. Yeah. Oh, wow, <laughs> That's man. the peak, right? So, so there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of doubt coming in from friends and family saying, why would you ever want to leave this and try to do your own thing? But um, it was good because I had people in my network and friendship circle like Raja who are already taking these risks Mm -hmm. and I was seeing it work out for him firsthand, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I was seeing him take this risk, try this business and it would work out, right? I remember back in the day, I would make fun of him for it, but he he (laughs) probably made more money than I did at the bank when he was selling his uh, Market Fluidity DVDs <laughs> and he was signing them. And, and people want to <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. I sold DVDs in a world where laptops did not come with CD ROMs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Mixtapes. And, <laughs> and, and, mix and what shocked me was like um, on initial first look, you'd think and have all this doubt like, bro, people don't have DVD players anymore. <laughs> Who's buying this, right? But he'd be selling out, right? So I'd be like, wow, the, there's so much opportunity in this world where the only limiting factor is people's own fears and doubts, yes. mm-hmm. right? But back to your original question, what helped me transition was first saving a nest egg of uh, capital where I would at least have a year of bills and expenses covered. And then it took off way, way more pressure off me because I feel like a lot of people, when they get into full-time trading, they create this pressure to perform. They mm-hmm. know, like, oh, I have to pay these bills. I have to make this certain amount of money. And when you have this like almost guaranteed thing, you don't have this, you don't have these investments. I'm not talking like Roger's perspective where he has like a monthly target. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about people have no money in the bank, no investments, no other stream of income. And all the pressure is on trading to make, to pay their bills at the month. It's almost asking to fail because you're putting on all this extra pressure to perform, right? So that really helped me transition from the corporate world more into the business side and trading Mm -hmm. side was creating that nest egg and then also just ignoring a lot of the doubters and naysayers mm-hmm. that like even the, it was my own it was my own mom and dad saying are you crazy <laughs> what are you doing like are you really yeah, gonna yeah. leave this right yeah so. especially with the position you were in though like you had a stable very well paying and respectable job as well mm-hmm. and in our culture respect is a very big thing right right yeah. are you earning 150k as a street sweeper who you um, no, 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 just no, 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 as an example. He's saying as an example. That's a lot of money for us. What? No, no, they, 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 they are you that, sleeping every day? <laughs> they don't care about the money, though. Yeah. He's just yeah. saying ten a, times he's more. He's just saying from an that's image true. perspective, yeah. You, yeah. Could, you could run some. You could be a hot dog stand owner making four hundred k, but people be like, oh, he's a hot dog stand. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm like, respect. give me that hot dog stand. If that's making me four hundred k, I'm taking the hot. Right. But my mom and dad would be like, no chance, no chance, no. Yeah. Because they're because but because especially in all cost our our culture they're all worried about politics and what mm-hmm. other people think of you that's true yeah, everybody everybody gonna... keeps trying to make decisions about what other people are going to think about what you're doing it's also more than that for you because not only you you were leaving the status and a, and a high position and the respect your family name had all yeah. of that it's also that you had to make at least 90k yeah. to break even on the opportunity yeah so if you were making only 90k a year it was not worth your time mm-hmm. you could have just stayed in your job yeah so you have to make a lot more than so your, your benchmark is so high where other people are like, let me just recover my bills let me just make two three k a month you're like no i have to make what i was making previously and then some to be to be yeah. a justified opportunity yeah, to make it more beneficial i think one thing also i noticed was that that with you i think there wasn't much of a need or like a pressure to impress yeah mm. You know, like even yeah. though you're making 90K, I never really seen you or seen him like with like, you know, like a nice fancy car or like these yeah, new yeah. brand new things, spanking mm-hmm. things. So I think that's where most people go wrong. Like once they go to a level of making like, let's say like 10,000 extra a year or like, you know, like 2K mm-hmm. extra a month, they get that extra expense added to their whole baggage. Right. And yeah. then you're like, oh shit, now I got to pay this off. I got to pay this off. My yeah, month, they, they call my that monthly. lifestyle inflation. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Lifestyle, lifestyle inflation. Yeah, yeah. Did you have that element of family pressure on um, you not leaving that corporate uh, respectable position? There was 100% that pressure. But as soon as I started to do my own thing and show that I was stable, and like, for example, as soon as I bought my mom a car, everybody shut up after that, right? They're like, okay, <laughs> this guy's. Yeah. This guy's doing okay now, right? Like so, with a regular job, you're never going to be able to do that. No, mm-hmm. no, 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 no chance. No, 
Yeah. People are struggling in Canada to buy themselves a car and pay the bills while they're still <laughs> mm. working full time, right? Yeah. So, but yeah, one thing that helped me was um, even when I transitioned and then I started making ten thousand a month or twenty thousand a month, um, my lifestyle pretty much remained the same. Uh, like I'm pretty simple, where I just like to go to the gym. Right. I just like to chill out at home and stuff like that. I'm not really like we would have fun times rarely together where we go out and splurge. Yeah, but yeah. it's like a unique event. And yeah. because it was rare, it made it much more enjoyable. It made it a much better memory compared to these people who you see after work. They're depressed. They go to the bar every mm. weekend. They're drinking because they want to forget about their bills. They want to forget about this. Uh, they want to forget about all the all the stress they have in their life. So they always are looking for an escape where for me, I was never looking for an escape. Whenever we did do something fun like that or splurge some money, it was very enjoyable and it was a very good memory. You know what I mean? So Our life was the escape from the yeah, real world. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's <laughs> like, true. Like once you're 100 percent content with yourself, you don't want to escape your own reality. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is something I talked to my wife about, too, like. Cause she most times says, "Oh, like you, like you know, like you're in the office, like you're by yourself." I'm, I enjoy being with myself. I 100 enjoy that, you know, because at the end of the day, the only person who's gonna be with you is gonna be you. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to go to the bar, like you know, to forget about the things, you're trying to escape your own self, and mm -hmm. you can't do that because once you do that, you're not really trying to see, like you know, what you're most capable of. Mm. You know, so you so I think that you just end up in a vicious cycle of self destruction, mm -hmm. right? And then, like he said, mm. just if you quit drinking, just quit, right? <laughs> <laughs> just stop, right? But, right, right. How long have you been married? How many years? Ten years. Oh, so you, you were married been. before you were successful, let's say yeah. financially. Yeah. So how yeah, exactly. how was that kind of period where you were going through risky decisions that maybe maybe not your wife, but your wife's family were thinking. Why does he not just get a job and, and be stable? No, they, they, when we got married, they thought that I graduated and I had like a great job and I was like decent and all that <laughs> shit. Like, you know how it is in like brown families, yeah, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, Munda job, all this graduated. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and that's something I talked about yesterday in one of our live streams was that there was a time where we were renting an apartment and the rent for the apartment was like $1,300, right? And there was a month that we couldn't pay that rent because I was chasing my dreams, mm -hmm. right? Like I was trying to chase trading. I was trying to make money, but it wasn't working. Taking I was losing. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So we had to pawn our wedding jewelry oh, to wow. pay that rent. And that rent was $1,300. And yesterday in the live streams, in 20 minutes, I make $1,300. So right. It just so shows you that yeah. it just change. goes to show that it, it didn't take me six months to get to that. It took me like six years to get to that point. And when I did that outcome yesterday, 1300, I told everyone the same story. I was like, like, wow, now, now, now like the dynamics of reality have totally shifted. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so That's you crazy. will go through tough times, but it doesn't matter like how long that tough times are like your time is going to come. You know, some people think, oh, you know, I want to get there maybe like, you know, next week, next month, you know, in six months. No, give it time. Give it like mm -hmm. six years, seven years, 10 years. Be excited where you're going to be in the next five years rather than where you want to be in the next five days because you see someone bawling out. Yeah. And, and, and with what he's adding on to, sorry to interrupt, with uh, bawling out, a lot of people who are just seeing... Uh, Raja's Instagram now over the last couple of years they, <laughs> yeah, they yeah. don't they don't realize like the first few years the amount of content he was making and live yeah. streams every day and webinars he was creating that's still 100% available on the on the Raja Banks YouTube it's insane right yeah. so people don't see people it was don't, daily at one point right yeah live daily. streams every day yeah I grind it daily people oh, wow, people don't that. see all the work that goes into the end result they just see the end result and they want to either compare to it or get envious of it or hate on it but they don't see the years of sacrifice the years yeah. of work and knowledge development experience developed to get to there right that's, that's why I have like so much more respect because I was there observing that just from the sidelines through the entire process right mm. No, that's, that's something you mentioned in Hookabaz when you were sitting down as well. You're like, people are only seeing... Because you bought four cars in four weeks. <laughs> yeah, that's that, that's crazy, mad. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to know when you're going to stop. <laughs> no, stop now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, people are only seeing that now. But what they don't see is for the six years before that, you're buying properties, you're getting your investment straight, you're setting your family up and everything. And now that you're enjoying yourself, people, they got the illusion that it's just come now. It's true. 
and they don't see everything that went behind there and all the structure you put up behind and there. More likely, well. you're gonna get more followers these days because you're being the flashy guy, whereas previously you were more value driven, and probably not as many followers were catching on. But these new guys that are coming to follow you and they're seeing, okay, Roger's got X, Y, Z and he's got these number of cars and so forth. What advice would you give to them that are kind of newly tuning into you? Yeah, you know, what I'm trying to do now is I'm trying to not post a lot about it. I'm trying to now shift towards posting more about charts and value and knowledge. But it's hard not to post about that because it's just all there. Yeah. Right. So I mean, and you also feel proud, like you do, mm -hmm. like you, you, you hiding it. like you, you did this, right? Like anybody mm -hmm. who starts a business, like the path you're on, your stuff, you can say you did this, mm -hmm. right? Like you put in all that work, all that sacrifice, and people say, oh, it's showing off. It's not showing off. It's just showing the hard work and the and the end result of this hard work, right? So it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Like I drove a Honda Civic. For the first five years. Yeah, big coffee mm -hmm. stain in the passenger seat. I always had to yeah. go into selling. <laughs> yeah. I was like, bro, you can at least get this stain clean, right? He's like, no, leave it, bro. It's just dried out now. It's not going to do anything. <laughs> yeah, trust me. White Honda Civic. You know, one, one thing I have in my head um, is I, I always like to think forward. I, I, I don't care for my current comfort. I don't care for my current luxury. Because let's say I'm enjoying a vacation and it's beyond my means. I'm not going to enjoy that moment because I'm, I'm going to be thinking, okay, this is going to hurt me in the future. Whereas people are, a lot of people are just in the moment. They want to think about the future. For me, it's the opposite. I'd rather suffer now and be comfortable in the future. And that uh, that's an extreme example, but I still have remnants of that. So for me, it'll be, um, if I knew I was being a, staying as a dentist, I knew I would have not only a stable career and, and an X amount of income. I know that I'll have a guaranteed pension <laughs> when I retire. And uh -huh. and all of right? these, all of these perks that come with the job. Uh, and that's a complete security piece of mind and stability. So mm -hmm. right now, let's say I'm earning more than a dentist. So today I'm, I'm, I'm good, but I can't help but think when I'm 65, I'm not going to have that pension yeah. that, that I can fully switch off at 65 because I know I've got a monthly something coming in. So then that adds something on my plate of, okay, it's, it's 40 years from now, but I, I'm still thinking, what am I going to do later on in life? So wh what would you guys advise to, to that kind of side of investing and, and, and make sure you're sound for the future? I, I was I was getting the advice from him where he keeps telling me property, property, property at the end of the day and, and not just property, <laughs> but land as well. So things like uh, things like property and land at the end of the day, or even if you're looking at incremental stock market investing, besides the crisis period, stock market is designed to go up long term. Right. Mm -hmm. Or property besides these periods where you have a correction. If you look at a long term hundred year chart on property prices, it's only going up. Same thing mm -hmm. with land and everything else. Right. So I think the best thing we can do, um, especially in our position, is it's great that we don't have that short sightedness, but still put some money to the side that we can start investing into these various pools that will bring you more long term wealth. It's mm -hmm. a it's a slower pace, but it's a more dependable pace, similar to mm -hmm. like what you're saying and looking for in the aspect of a pension. Right. At the end of the day. Even with some of these uh, pensions that are being offered from a government perspective or from a company perspective, a lot of those still have risks that can come with it too, right? Mm -hmm. But at, uh, but owning owning and having ownership of these assets, that's something that's always going to be you know, under I, your belt. So I completely agree, and that's obviously the, the normal answer. But I can't help but think that, yes, the stock market has historically gone up, and it probably will continue to. Mm -hmm. Same for property. Yeah. But when and therefore, you know, you know, your asset is, is dependable and it's increased, it's appreciating. Mm -hmm. But when you I've seen charts of like uh, property prices and then uh, corrected for inflation. So, of course, the, the price has gone up, but the value of the currency has gone down. Yeah. So then the that true value of the investment isn't the same or the stocks. Yes, the value of the stock market has gone up, but the currency has gone down. So, you know, it's not always. But that's but. That's where it comes in handy because it's completely different when you're looking at the one percenters versus the 99 percent. The 99 percent majority of the free cash flow that they get from working a job goes into consumption. Mm -hmm. So inflation heavily damages them. But at the end of the day, inflation is a very sticky subject where obviously if you go into a high risk inflation, hyperinflation, it's going to destroy an economy. But Inflation is actually beneficial for the rich because it inflates the price of all yeah. these assets that they own, mm -hmm. right? So when we saw, for example, inflation heavily increase, when you're looking at the consumer side, everybody's cost of living went up. Gas prices went up, 
all this like uh, your general basket of goods of going to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. But for that super rich guy who has an investment portfolio or a commodities portfolio, real estate, all of that value went up as well. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, you're not really your wealth isn't really denominated by how much cash you essentially have on hand. It's about the value of these assets that you own. Right. That's true. But what about like, say, the buying power of that? Mm -hmm. um, if you didn't put it into property and you kept it in cash, you would have lost the value yeah, the because be, of inflation. Exactly. But if you put it into property, I feel like uh, at least from some of the graphs I've seen, the property kind of keeps you at the level of the same buying power. It's not a true investment. It's just keeping your money safe. Yes. Yeah, so yeah that's, that's it's, it's an investment in, in keeping your money safe, but it's also just about that you have these assets that are actually of your ownership under your belt mm -hmm. versus cash, which is just going to continue to deplete or yeah. anything like an expense, which you're just paying to live. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, see, so here's how I think. Like, I get your point, what you're trying, trying to say is that, like, normally when you have a job, right? You have a job, you know you're going to get a certain amount coming in every month, you know, and then you're going to have retirement, and then you're going to be good, right? But once you're, let's say, you're an entrepreneur, or you're trading, or you have a business or whatever, there's a lot of risk attached to that, that what if this business does not survive the next 10 years, you know, or the next, like, in 15, 20 years, what's going to happen after that? So I've had this approach, and I think about this all the time now, my brother... He's into our family le leather and he does really well in Canada. And we speak on and off and we speak about the fact that, okay, like, you know, every morning, what do you think about every morning when you wake up? So every morning when I wake up, I'm always waking up in a mode of scarcity, right? And scarcity, I mean like, okay, what if my business just shuts down today? It's like mm -hmm. this fear that drives yeah, you. What am I going to do yeah. after that? Yeah. Right. So my goal has been simple that, okay, now my dynamics is I have two kids and what I want to do is I want to, if let's say everything shuts down, I want to have money and hard assets. Like let's say we have a property in Canada, we have a property in Pakistan, now we have a property in Dubai. My whole goal is to make sure that these properties are paid off, mm -hmm. right? And have enough in the bank to make me go for full one year, mm -hmm. you know? And that comes with a point that, okay, that you know yourself that even though if your business shuts down, you're going to have your expenses paid for one full year and you got to be smart enough to know that, okay, how are you going to pick yourself back up within mm -hmm. that one year, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Because then challenge is going to be that, okay, what can you start within that one year, 365 days, that's going to pay for your normal expenses, like your grocery, mm -hmm. your, your utilities and whatnot. But the main thing is you have to have a property that's paid off. And, be and another thing going into that, that he reminded me of with his um, Canadian house he owns is, owning having the fully paid off home and no mortgage whatever and owning it under your belt as the asset is fantastic for your wealth value but it also brings you opportunity where with, with we understand that the majority of general working canadians will never be able to own a home they need to rent mm -hmm. and they're going to go to him they're going to go to people like him who already own the homes or own the buildings to rent so you mm -hmm. still have that type of income that comes in on top of that investment property as well right so you still have that the, the Canadian home on rent as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, but all that came from starting a business. Mm -hmm. There's like starting a business, working for yourself, creating new ideas. There's no bigger blessing than that. Mm -hmm. None. Never. Like I've 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 heard no one say that, oh, like, you know what? Um, I've been working for so and so company and now I own seven homes. Yeah. There's not one single person I know. The only people like that, they do exist. They buy a home and their whole life plan is to pay off this house mm -hmm. with a 30-year mortgage. And by mm -hmm. the time they're 65, their house is paid off and now they're chilling. Yeah. You know, and it's not even an asset because if they're living in it, they're not getting rent, money. So it's, yeah. it's a liability. They have expenses to pay off the mortgage. They can't really yeah. sell it as well. Yeah, they're exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah you know, exactly. Myself, I've been, because I don't understand property too well, and maybe both of you are a bit better, you can advise, but... Because of that confusion I have and because I know interest rates are very high, I don't know if the market is reaching a peak and I don't want to buy something in the next three years, it corrects. Bro, so I stay I, cash heavy and mm. I think I think logically, okay, long term probably property is the smarter thing to do and if you kind of get in at any point, it doesn't matter if you got in high or low, in 20, 30 years, it's not going to matter. But right now in the short term, because I'm in my 20s, I think more, what is a more aggressive approach? What is going to give me a higher ROI? You're I overthinking. Think, I had this, I, but, but I, had I don't, this exact I, same I justify month. it because I'm like, if I get a watch and... You know, the, the Pepsi you had, you bought mm. it for 7K, you, you can sell for 20K. That's that's a 200% return, I had which a property thing. wouldn't. Or I this had one, this exact 70, same mindset. can sell it for 200. Yeah. 
that that's a, again 200% return that a that a property is going to give me in 200 years yeah so that that's so, my so this happened with our personal conversations during the covid period where I, I had this exact same mindset i had this cash ready i knew i wanted to eventually own a property invest and um grow that way uh, that way as well but i kept waiting cuz i was thinking man interest rates are going to be going up the market is so volatile global mm -hmm. economies are so volatile he kept telling me bro, buy a property. Long term, it's an investment. You're overthinking it, right? And I kept saying, oh, no, I'm waiting for this inevitable correction, right? Mm -hmm. I, when I, mm -hmm. I had this feeling like as soon as I buy, the market's going to correct 40, 50%. House prices are going to go down 40, 50%. And at the end of the day, it never happened. Over mm -hmm. the last three, four years, what, what we never saw anything that drastic. You're, I don't think we're in property or land. You're ever going to see that drastic of a change in price that you're not going to be able to recover in the next five years anyways. You get mm. what I'm saying? Like, for example, even with the uh, rate hikes that are front loaded right now, we're seeing the Bank of England and the UK. Mm. We're seeing Canada and the US do it. We may see a correction in house prices by 15, 20 percent, which would be very subdued mm. and normal. But that correction is going to last in the long term scope of things. When you're thinking about 30, 40 years, that correction is going to be th two, three years long. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Before house prices are back to peak highs and yeah, trending so that, that again. was my exact question of uh, if I'm looking to get into property in the next three years, would I be better off waiting? Because now interest rates are very high. They're trying to control inflation and, mm -hmm. and people are struggling now to pay back their, their repayments. So that's naturally going to um, put prices onto the uh, sorry properties onto the market because yeah. people can't afford it they get uh, repossessed and so forth and that's increasing supply is going to naturally bring things down yeah. demand is not the same because people can't afford the same buying power because of interest rates yeah. so I, I can anticipate i don't know when but in the in the short term definitely a correction or my my wrong in that you no, can not, there's um, for sure an increased probability to see some type of correction but i think raja and i are just more talking about in the mindset where if you're just constantly waiting for this correction and it mm. never comes, then you're going to miss an opportunity true, true. where real estate is going to continue to go up for the next 10 years or land mm. prices or commodity mm. prices are going to continue to go up the next 10 years, right? So I think what he more explained to me was I was also waiting for this type of correction and larger change in price because I was thinking like, oh, I could get a house in Canada or whatever for $100,000, $200,000 cheaper. Mm. That would be a big saving. That would be a big saving, a better opportunity and so forth. But he just said like, even with that correction or change, in the next five years, you're going to be back to higher prices and you're going to continue to make more money on your investment as these asset classes increase in value, right? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we just shared this similar view of having this fear mm -hmm. of you're going to buy a house right now. It's going to be very volatile. You're going to, it's going to go down 200K and you feel like you lost. But I, you, I, like I in the say, moment, I wouldn't right? say it's a fear necessarily. I'm, I'm more trying to think what is the most logical. Mm. And for example, yeah. he said we we've we're more into commodity at the moment because gold. We didn't touch on it fully, but yeah. right now gold buys make so much sense long term. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, with with what, uh, Russia and China doing accumulating stock, at least in Dubai, at least everybody is buying gold right now. Yeah, uh, and it's flying, flying off the shelf. So we thought, okay, right now, at least short term, gold is making a little bit more sense than property because property there is at least a probability that's going to go down in the next yeah. two, three years. Maybe a healthy correction that but was not going to matter. you guys are buying physical gold then? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah see, here's, here's, here's what we did, right? So we just bought a, a home right here. It was like $1.3, $1.4 million. Um, as a non-resident, we had to pay 50% down, mm -hmm. right? And everyone told me, oh, like, you know, it's at the high right now. You're paying a premium. The interest rates are high and this and that. And my whole idea was this. I'm cash heavy right now. Where can I safely put cash mm -hmm. that if I need it at any given moment, I'm going to get that same cash back? Because yeah, I don't look at property in a way of oh, it's going to appreciate and this and that. I look at property in a way that, okay, if shit hits the fan, I'm going to have property, mm -hmm. which it will never, ever give me a loss. Yeah. It will give you a break even. Mm -hmm. And for people to say that, okay, oh, it gave you break even, you made no money, you suck, man, fuck them. Because here's <laughs> the thing. I paid $700,000 down payment for the house. And now I know that if things go bad, I can get that seven hundred thousand dollars back, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And I think in Dubai, at least you're protected from the rest of the world's problems because here it's yeah. going to go up, and I'm confident in that. Ex bro, there's no more land being made mm -hmm. apart from the islands they build. <laughs> there's no more land being made, right? Yeah. So, so if you look at property in the next two years, three years, four years, no, man. Like, look at property ten years, fifteen years, twenty mm -hmm. years. It's a different time frame. You have to yeah, look the at way it. I do property now is because that it. Let's say if I die, my kids are there, mm -hmm. right? They will own that property. 
that's it. So I'm not going to look at property. Now, now we're looking at maybe buying like a small condo or like a small townhouse for Airbnb and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. other than that, like the property we bought in Canada, we bought it at in that time was at like a premium. Right now, there's a higher pre- premium. Property we bought in Pakistan was at a premium then. Now it's much higher. Mm. Same thing in Dubai now, right? We bought a property at a risk and guys said, oh, it's at a premium. We're like, it's okay. I don't think it's a matter here because no. the problems that happen in, in London, let's say the property market is going to have some issues maybe in the future. That money is not going to go in, like out of thin air. It's going to come here or where places they feel more... It's going to disperse. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. The money is going to come here. So I think here is actually a, a bubble that is protected and insulated from the problems of the West. Just buy it. I, I, I Just, think, yeah. you know what you're saying about inflation and properties are not catching up. I'm not sure if I fully agree with that because I think the graphs that you're probably looking at are probably last year's inflation extrapolated. Mm. That's so true like too. When they did all the money, low interest is, rates, money printing, yeah. and yeah. Yeah. So they looking at 10% inflation This is like the worst case scenario levels. of inflation being extrapolated. But if you average it out, rent is bringing you an average 7%. Appreciation mm. of the property is 5 6%. And then you got positive cash flow coming in every month. That cash flow is always higher, typically than the average inflation mm-hmm. so even if a crash ca- happens if a crash of 15 percent happens for example over three years or a crash of 20 percent over three years the positive cash flow that you have makes up for that and mm-hmm. then the appreciation is the profit on top and especially yeah. when you're looking at that time frame of 10 15 years yeah. of appreciation and then that's, that's true too that's a very good point he made about um inflation was very skewed over the last three years with the amount of money printing yeah. and low interest rates where most countries like Canada, U.S. and U.K. were going to a higher risk, 9 10%. But we can see even in the example of U.S. with some of the last CPI reports, we're already back down to 4 from a 9%, mm. right? So, And it's only a problem if you have a mortgage. If you cash it out, then you're yeah. fine. Mm. Because if everyone defaults on the mortgages and more properties come on the market, when people can't afford to buy their rent and rent prices go up, so you're protected on that side as well. When you make more money than 90% of the population, you're not worried about inflation you're not worried mm-hmm. about interest yeah, rates you're not true. you're not you're not really worried about that because like those problems are for people who are not making enough money and that mm-hmm. goes back to what we were saying where like the the one percent the people who are making more money than the 99 percent all any free cash flow they really get from their businesses they just go into ownership yeah they're mm-hmm. buying they buy homes they buy mm-hmm. homes they buy <laughs> they buy land they buy com- like they buy commodities and they just and buy more businesses because they just want more ownership because even if inflation does rise, all those assets rise too, right? Mm-hmm. And it just mm-hmm. increases their overall wealth value because that's how it's mm-hmm. like denominated. So it's very interesting that wise. Fair enough. I think we're coming out to six. So we'll, I just want to leave it as a last question for you, okay. which is, are we going to see you in Dubai anytime soon? Mm. You speak mm-hmm. highly of it. It's a, it's a great place to be here in the Royal Atlantis. But Honestly, coming from uh, Canada to Dubai, Canada is turning into a prison country. Right. Let's see. There's way too much social nonsense going on, yeah. way too much radical ideology. Agenda. Right. And uh, and with Dubai, the the amount of opportunities they bring people because they want business here. They mm. want people who have an abundance mindset and people want to do more. <laughs> Dubai's targeting them. Right. Where all these other mm. Western countries are like the opposite. Mm. They're they're punishing people like that. Right. Mm-hmm, they're mm-hmm. having 40 percent tax rates for anybody who has their own business and is trying to do more. So for me, I for sure want to come back to Dubai, but not to visit. I more want to move here. There now. you go. Yeah. I was going to say also for your trading hours, I bet they're a nightmare in, in Canada. In Canada, it's not in Canada. It's still good because um, I still get the prime New York session time. Right. So mm-hmm. for trading is still good like that. And it's good that Asian session is around the evening time for me to look for any day trade setups. I'll be asleep during London, but I know with Dubai times, you get to cover... London lot. is uh, 11 a.m. Yeah, you get you a lot get more session <laughs> coverage, yeah. right? Yeah, you, you can have a lion and still, and still make London sessions. Yeah, session. right? <laughs> there we go. Excellent stuff. And both of you, thank you for coming on again. And yeah. It was a nice chat. Thank you, man. Thank pleasure. you for having me. Great podcast.